Hey, Dr. Glenn here from Mehab, the uh, world's leading physical therapy alternative where our goal is to educate and empower you to take control of your recovery. Got a video request here to do a commentary on how to cure plantar fasciitis by Bob and Brad, which is a uh, physical therapy YouTube channel. Let's see what they have to say. You want to find the root cause of your plantar fasciitis pain and try to solve it. That's right, and the experts uh, have it narrowed down to three primary causes. Number one is your footwear. Maybe it needs to be changed. Number two is the calf muscle in this complex. There's some treatment for that, as well as your walking habits. Are you walking properly? So, in this video... So, I can already tell what this video is going to be about. Um, I can tell you that there's a number of reasons and for plantar fasciitis and why it happens, and it's multifaceted. Um, narrowing it down to three is pretty uh, reductionist. And also, uh, the three things that they mention um, will have very little to do with it. So problem number one, according to Dr. Ray McClanahan, who is a podiatrist, the big reason your plantar fasciitis isn't going away is probably your footwear. That's right. If you look at the majority of footwear made, it looks very nice. However, the toe box, which is right here, is oftentimes, a majority of times, pointed like a V. And what happens is your toes get crunched up in there, and they really get smushed, if you will, or compressed. So when your footwear is too narrow, like Brad is going to demonstrate in my foot, it is going to compress your toes together. And this is going to reduce the blood flow from the arteries going to your feet that innervate into the plantar fascia underneath here. So the plantar fascia does not have great blood flow, but they, you don't require blood flow for things to heal. There's other ways for the tissue to get fed. Uh, mechanotransduction is one of those things. Yes, a tight toe box can cause some issues, but not typically plantar fasciitis. And the medial and lateral plantar arteries, which do feed a majority of the foot, um, are not going to be compressed until reaching your toes. So it's really not going to make a difference for anything that's more proximal to that. So um, I don't think that's going to be a necessary cause. Interesting side note on toe box. Yes, you don't want to have a tight toe box um, unless you're into wearing heels and pumps. Uh, but what uh, there's actually two measurements to a foot that I actually found out. Um, so I have a size 13 foot. So when you measure my from my heel to my big end of my big toe, I am a size 13. Uh, but as it turns out, there's actually another measurement we should look at, and that is the arch length of your foot. So if you look at the Branock device, which is the metal device that you see at all the department stores, on the side of when you put your heel in, there's a little adjustable piece of metal that goes up and it sits on the outside of your big toe and it will point to a different number. And in my case, the toe length was 13, my foot length was 13, but my arch length was a 14 and a half. So what I did is I actually switched my shoes to a 14 and a half and I got rid of a lot of the problems I was having as an athlete, which was uh, getting blisters and calluses on the bottom of my feet, uh, foot cramping, and also losing my toenails. So it's just something you might want to look at. Maybe I'll do a video on that later on. And again, I just want to emphasize that blood flow. Everyone in the medical field is so aware of healthy blood flow equals healthy tissues. And if we starve the tissues of blood, there's going to be problems, and that's what happens with plantar fasciitis. So that is partially true. Um, we do like to have lots of blood flow. That does make healing a little bit uh, easier, which is part of the problem why we have to be concerned with people that have diabetic neuropathy, which is a microvascular disease where the blood vessels actually get very, very small and reduces blood flow, which in turn has effect on the, the nerves. But it's also why when people with diabetes do get foot uh, injuries, it's much, much harder for them to recover and heal um, and often lead to infections. So, the thing you want to look at is the heels on your shoes. So an elevated heel like this one is going to put more stress on your calf muscles, which we'll talk about later, and a zero drop shoe will not cause these problems. So they're talking about having a decreasing your, your 
heel size so that it's called zero drop so that it's flat from the it's the same height from the from the front to the back they're making it a much bigger deal than it is particularly when you talk about sports shoes we're not talking about you know inches or multiple centimeters of of change we might only be talking one or two the issue really starts to become uh, when you start getting much higher than that so for example if you're wearing high heels or stilettos or something like that that level of elevation can cause some increased stress but let me get a little bit nerdy here what that actually does is it changes the ground reaction force so that's the line of force that the ground imparts back on you when you put your foot onto the ground what that does is it moves the line of force behind the knee which creates a flexion moment at the knee so your quads have to work harder to stop your knee from kind of buckling because that's the what a knee flexion moment does it makes it want to bend um, and it also increases the dorsiflexion moment or the ankle that's which when your foot comes up at the ankle and so you have to push down a little bit harder with your plantar flexors which is going to be your plantar intrinsic uh, foot muscles particularly the flexors and it was also the plantar flexors as well so uh, it does change things but the, the differences that do, they're talking about the change is going to be nominal um, and probably not that big of a deal so I wouldn't worry about it now if your toes are scrunched up even when you take your shoe off what can work is some type of toe spreader so I have the correct toes here these are actually Dr. A. McClanahan's brand he works with uh, they're very nice you can wear them while you're walking simply put them in like this and you can put your socks over it in your shoes and it'll help so it sounds like there's going to be a pitch for his products um, or his services at some point because obviously he's pitching this one and I'm not sure why we've gone onto this subject when we're talking about plantar fasciitis but just be aware that there's lots of product placement things going on um, out in social media. The calf muscles are absolutely directly connected to the plantar fasciitis and I'll explain that with this little demonstration. The black tape represents the plantar fasciitis here. I have it cut off here but it actually goes up a little farther across the foot. Now it connects up directly to the heel and the calf muscle connects up directly to the opposite side of the heel or the calcaneus bone. So this is a common misconception. Uh, in fact, in adults, it does not do that. Uh, there's very, very few cases where that is a continuous band. In children, it is a little bit more common, um, but not in adults. So this is a misconception. That's why calf stretching really has nothing to do with um, plantar fasciitis. Yes, yeah, so when that calf is tight, it creates the plantar fascia to be tight, which eventually can cause some mic. That is just not true, just for all the reasons that I said before. An interesting side note is that tightness or perception of tightness in the calves is, is just that. It's a perception, and there's lots of ways you can get around with uh, changing that perception. You can rub it, you can stretch, you can put heat on, you can do anything, you can just do light exercise and it will change the perception of tightness. Um, but again, it's not related to tight plantar fascia. So the first solution, like we mentioned earlier, is to get a shoe with zero drop. So what that means is the heel is the same height as the forefoot. If you look at this shoe, the heel is elevated. First thing not to do is run out and buy zero drop shoes. The change is, I said before, is basically minimal and there is much more significant things you can do to change that if you've watched my other videos um, then do that so don't run out and spend money on zero drop shoes for whatever reasons they're claiming here this is how most shoes are brad's going to demonstrate how this affects your calf muscles here right so if we look down here the shoes i'm wearing are zero drop so i'm going to put a little block there to simulate if I had a normal pair of shoes elevating my heel, you know, half inch or so, and the tendon right here, or the calf muscle, you can see is on slack, okay, and it'll start to tighten down that way, which puts pressure and tightness all the way to the calf, or to the uh, plantar. Now, if I pull that out and put my zero drop shoes in, watch what happens right here to that tendon things pull up and they tighten so you get a little bit of a so that's another misconception what he's saying here is that if you walk around in shoes with a high heel what's going to happen is that tissue is going to adaptively shorten 
to that length um, and that's going to cause problems. But the research shows that it takes very, very minimal time outside of that range of motion, even if you've been sitting in that, that position for, for 12 hours, just spending five or 10 minutes out of that range will negate any negative effects of being in that position. So don't fall for that. A little bit of stretch, and that's gonna eliminate that chronic tightness just from walking around with a zero drop shoe, and that's without doing stretches. So it's kind of a easier way to <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Just stretch it out. I get my cameras mixed. Another important note is that even during normal gait through weight transfer to, to toe off, we end up doing a lot more calf stretching or dorsiflexion. Um, in that position anyways. So it's gonna just walking around will be more than enough to change that. Okay, the second solution if you have tight calf muscles is to wear a night splint. So you only wear this at night when you are in bed, or I guess if you're laying down for a prolonged period of time, you can as well. So when you sleep commonly with your bed sheets on, however you sleep on your back, stomach, or side, most of the time you sleep like my left foot is here. It is pointed down like that. That is going to put more stress on the calf muscles and possibly cause plantar fasciitis over time. So that's not true in any shape or form. If you've ever just sat in bed with your feet out straight and your toes kind of flop forward, your foot trying to kind of flops forward, you will notice that your calf muscle, like other things, is completely flaccid and relaxed. It's not tight. Um, it's, that makes no sense at all. You know, I don't want to interrupt Mike, but I do want to mention if you have symptoms of getting out of the bed in the morning and you experience this, oh, and it hurts like crazy, those first few steps, and it works itself out after a few steps or a couple minutes of walking, then the night splint is more indicated and I would uh, recommend that. I've had, we've had people have good luck with this if that happens when you get out of bed in the morning. So that's just bad advice. There's a number of reasons of why you could get foot pain when you first get out of the bed. Um, one that kind of springs to the mind is a lumbar radiculopathy that usually clears out and gets better after a number of steps. Um, and then as soon as you sit or flex for a prolonged period, if that's the aggravating motion, it will bring back those foot symptoms at all. It does not, there's not any indication that you need a night splint. Night splints are uncomfortable and in, as with everything else, if you've seen the other videos, there's a million other things that you can do before I start looking at night splints. All right, now the third thing to address is your walking style, or we call it gait in the therapy world. First, we're gonna show the typical way people walk. It's called a heel strike. Mike, can you demonstrate? Okay, now when you walk forward, typically the ankle comes up, we call that dorsiflexion. The heel strikes first, the knee is fully locked out, and what happens there, there's a lot of impact right there that goes all the way up to the joints, taking stress on the joints as well as the plantar, plantar fasciitis and the uh, heel, or the uh, complex calf, calf. Thank you, boy, I was stuck there for a second. So this is just a pure case of fear mongering. If anyone's actually ever walked, there's not significant impact from heel strike in any shape or form and very few people go into full knee, locked knee extension anyways. Everyone usually is just a little bit outside of that. Most people actually have a little bit more than quote unquote zero degrees of knee extension. They actually go a little bit of called recurvatum. So you're not in a full locked out knee extension. There's no impact and it's not dangerous to your ankle, your hip or your knee or your back. This is fear mongering to get you to buy in. It's nonsense. Now, the, how you wanna change that is go ahead, we're gonna swing forward in your forefoot. Not your toes, but your forefoot. Now Mike's exaggerating here a little bit. When I walk like this, I kinda come down. There isn't much there, I think. At least that's the way my mind sees it. <laughs> I should take a video of it. But the forefoot accepts the weight. There's a little give there. It's not like your heel banging into the ground. And look at the knee, slightly flexed. And that... As I went off my little nerd spout about ground reaction force, this is exactly what I'm talking about. When you do have forefoot or midfoot stance, what it does is it does increase the load um, of your plantar fascia. So this is doing the opposite thing of what they're saying it's gonna do. They're saying it's gonna decrease it when in fact it's not because the heel, as they, the way that they're walking, is not touching the ground and you're impacting with the, your forefoot. Your toe flexes have to contract a little bit 
potentially harder or longer um, to absorb that weight. So they're actually putting more stress through the plantar fascia and particularly the plantar tr intrinsic muscles, which um, I believe is what most of plantar fascia pain is, that it's actually the tendinopathy. That, that takes that impact off of the hips and the joint as well as the, the whole leg. So when we say soft knee walking, that's how that got its name, but everything else here happens. Mike, can you demonstrate with a typical heel strike for a few steps? Why don't you back up a little bit so we get it in the camera. And heel strike, and this is typical. If you think about that heel striking into the surface, particularly a hard surface, I mean, there's a case in point. Look, look how impactful that heel strike is and look how locked his knee is. It's just ridiculous. That's going to take its toll, and it does take its toll on people's joints, plantar fat. No, it does not take its toll on people's joints. Shitas, hips, back, etc. Now demonstrate the proper soft knee technique. Whoa, it's soft. It's soft. <laughs> So and when you do a soft knee technique or walking on your forefoot, you're going to have to take shorter strides or distance with each step. It feels a little awkward at first to get accustomed to it, but over time... I'm sure it's just as awkward as it is stupid looking. There's no reason to do this. Potentially, if I'm, giving them, if I'm throwing them a bone here, the decrease of step length is decreasing the amount of time that you're on one foot for. So if you have one painful foot, potentially it could unload it a little bit, but you're still walking around looking like that for no real reason. Um, yeah. All right, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we were gonna give you a lot of information and we did. There we go, they've definitely provided you with some uh, information. I would garner that it's misinformation or misunderstood information. Um, I would personally not do any of those three things. If there's any videos that you would like me to do a commentary on or any topics you'd like me to discuss, please just drop them down below in the comments. As always, please like and uh, subscribe and we'll catch you on the next one. Cheers.